That's a clip from a, it's on the RSA website, it's a longer lecture by Kenneth Robinson, a great, a great, a, a great thinker on education. And he, he's basically making two fundamental points there which are really telling. One is, uh, we've got a 19th century model of education in the 21st century. And the second is a thing that I don't think anybody's ever surprised by when they see it, which is that schooling knocks creativity out of kids systematically. And it's kind of you see it when you've got nieces and nephews who are little. When they're four and five, they could be anything in the world. And by the time they're 10, they could be fewer things. And by the time they're 15, they're really narrowed down. And that's a tragic thing when all of us, all of us say education is actually about liberation. So there's something there that's quite profound about about the tensions in the system that we have. It's very worth seeing the whole of the, the animation. It's also very worth reading the whole of the, the, whole of the lecture. So look, what's, the pro what's one of the problems that you find in public service framing of policy problems, of, of policy challenges? It tends to be a deficit model. It tends to say, you're lacking something, we can give it to you. It doesn't say, you've got a capacity, let's enhance it. And now, the thing is, we do have huge potential in, not just in our kids, but in our whole society, within the network, in our communities, in our networks, all these things are full. And one of the challenges that government has is to engage with that energy. At the moment, by and large, and this is true, I was a local councillor, so I speak from the heart on this. By and large, the only time you find out your local community has got a great web designer, a really good journalist, fantastic PR people, uh, great social media, uh, is when you do something they don't like and they turn it all on you. And so you feel this energy purely as anger. Now, not only is that frustrating to be at the wrong end of, it's frustrating at both ends because it's, it becomes a stale argument, both sides locked into, into something which if there'd been some preparation, some moving upstream, that we could possibly have got this right and got this better. So what are the solutions? I'm not going to give you the solutions to all these problems that I'm working on right now. One of the solutions is much, much, much better communication, uh, much cleverer communication. And I don't mean by that just rushing immediately to adopt social media. So going on Twitter, be on, you know, if you're on Twitter, as the Premier is, uh, and as I am, be on Twitter for a purpose. And one of the things about Twitter is it's a very authentic medium. So if you tweet, it shows who you are. And over time, people build up a picture of you, and that's quite a good thing. It's also a very polite medium. It's thought, I write for newspapers, I blog for newspapers, I never read the comments underneath my, my copy, because they're never, ever written by people who love me like my mum. Um, <laughs> they're, they're written by people who they think and type in green ink. Um, so, so it's not about social media, it's about the really hard work of communication. I don't know if you notice this in, 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 in your professional life. Quite often when you get to a, kind of, get to a point of, of, of developing something, you start thinking, what should the title be? Or how do we phrase this? Or how do we write this? And you kind of always park it and say, we can come back and do the work on the language a bit later. Nobody ever does come back and do the work on the language later. You're frozen with the first title that somebody thought of. And that's because work on language is really hard. Communication is really hard, good communication. It's incredibly hard, and yet that's probably the key to part of what we need to, uh, we need uh, to be tackling. Let's just have a look at this. This is from the Mothers and Children Hospital. Now, I love this. I love this poster for all kinds of reasons. Um, it shows you simply in a kind of weather map where it is that you don't wash your hands properly, where people mainly miss washing their hands. There's big lumps of red. Shocking. I mean, that is people not washing their hands properly. So that's coming out, uh, wandering around with germs all over your hands. It also talks about how long you should wash your hands for, 15, 20 seconds. How long is that? It tells you. It's long enough to sing a verse of happy birthday. So when you're washing your hands, what you guys should be doing is this and this and this and singing happy birthday to you, singing it to your Why is that good? It's good because actually it's a happy song. And it's actually, this could be a chore, but it's telling you how to do it and it's telling you how to do it in a way uh, that makes you feel happy. Ever since I saw this, I have been singing, I catch myself singing happy birthday while washing my hands. And 
I keep telling people the story, and I think it's one that sticks in your mind. When you hear it the first time, you kind of want to tell other people about it. So that is, there's some really complicated science and testing and research there, uh, and the knowledge that a lot of um, infections carry from hands. But you know, it's, it, this is true in a hospital, it's true in uh, a restaurant. It's just a really important, so that's complex information sieved into something. And it, it's important, I think, because we do a lot, as a government, what we do is we give a lot of printed information to people. And that's because, by and large, the people we are read lots of printed information. A lot of people don't consume printed information. Not because they can't, because they don't want to. So you end up with a message that you want everybody to hear, and you, you try and sell it in a channel that not everybody uses. And this, is, this, this, this connects back to Dollar Bill, which is that cheesy, uh, music, images, text, a combination, combination of different approaches. And I think anybody who reads newspapers uh, will have noticed that one big change in the last decade is that stories are shorter, but another big change is there's many more entry points into, news, into newspaper pages. Headlines are one, there'll be boxes, there'll be pictures, there'll be graphics. And why is that? They're trying to help you find your way, find the reader, find their way through information. I still don't think in terms of design, let alone sieving down complex information, we're good enough yet in the public service. We've got the knowledge, not of what we need to tell people, we've got the knowledge of how to tell it to them. We just don't combine these, these things together. And that's a really important strand of what we, of what we do. Um, we do it well in some areas, five fruit and veg. We do it well in other areas where, you know, go back to co-production. Who stops people drink driving? It's not the cops, it's your mate. It's the people who think you're a dickhead if you go drinking and driving. So that's, and that's, that's a set of messages that got bashed through and bashed through and bashed through. So what am I working on? I'm working on two small areas, small, when, when you hear, they're not that small, but I'm working on two areas of policy. One in health, looking at uh, older people and older people's services. And I'm certain that here in South Australia, if you are an older person and you have a crisis, you are treated as well here as anywhere I've seen in the world. There's no doubt about that. You've got very, very, very good hospitals, really caring, committed, passionate staff at all levels, and you get dealt with well. There are invariably pro problems when you move from that system into the community. Uh, and there are also huge challenges, in my view, huge challenges about getting adequate information about choices and interventions that can prevent uh, the crisis occurring. That's, that's, so th you, in, that, in that space, it seems to me that there's a lot of things that can be done in terms of information about choices for mum, uh, for the kids, for the neighbours. How do you maintain people's independence? How do you maintain people's uh, autonomy? But one of the, there's two, I think, two issues that are at the heart of this. One of them is, that, honestly, when I came to South Australia, I just, I had the view that you have an acute sector, you know, hospitals, and they've got a variety of clients come through, and a bunch of them are older people, and you need probably special services for them because they're quite heterogeneous, they've probably got, they've quite often got complicated problems. Um, but when I went to the, the Royal Adelaide Hospital, the clinician said the median age uh, of patients is, is 60, which means that half of all the patients are over 60. So in a sense, the Royal Adelaide Hospital is not an acute service with a geriatric service in it. It's a geriatric hospital with some acute patients turning up to it from time to time. Now, that's not meant to be glib. It's meant to be, if you thought that your core client group were older people, would you change the way you do things? Now. If the, if, if the RA was Qantas, there would be people who are frequent flyers, and there'd be things that were known about them when they turned up. Um, now, I know, they are, I know there is to some extent, I know there's an electronic patient record being established, but there's just a, a risk of reframing. If you thought that your core group was older people, how, and the thing about the core group being <coughs> older people, and this is a really important part of policy, right? Older people aren't other people, and it's not even that they're your mum and dad. Older people's policy is about us. Because the policies that we are developing about the services, the ones that we all receive when we're 60, 70, and 80, um, and 
And so it's, I remember sitting in a policy discussion once about pensions and they're saying, oh, this will happen in 2025. And I was thinking, that's ages off. Then I thought, that's when I'm retiring. <laughs> these, are real, these are real issues with a real proximate thing for us. And the second one is, if you, if you thought about older people, you might actually think, then, what do they want? And there's some really interesting research that I was told about. Um, if you ask young people what they value most in, a, in themselves in a health setting, they say autonomy. If you ask them what they think older people value most, they say oh, older people want safety and security. If you ask older people what they value the most, they say autonomy. So whose life is it anyway? There's people, younger people, running services, making judgments about older people, probably because they've not had the conversation. They've not actually discussed it with people. And that is really important, because autonomy is actually what all of our policies are meant to be about, keeping you living in your own home for longer, enabling you to you know, get, the, get, the hip get the hip done, get the fracture, but get, give you the physio so you can live on your own because people want to live on their own for as long as possible, or live in their, the house that they brought their family up in, the house that it's, they've been, the garden they've been looking after the last 30, 40, 50 years. So there's something really important about how we frame health services for older people. And then in education, what I'm looking at is partnership between schools and parents. Because there's two things we do know about education. A high-performing school has a high-performing principal. You know, strong leadership really can transform a school. Weak leadership can paralyze a school. Uh, but, it also, but also a very powerful partnership with parents. Uh, I've been down to the south uh, of Adelaide and I've met some parents and principals uh, and heard some really interesting things about things that are going on. There's a school, a high school, where the maths teacher is now giving parents the maths plan for the term. Now, some of you will have had terrible experiences with maths at school uh, yourselves. Um, you probably don't want your kids to go through the same thing. It may be hard to support them, but at least if you have the maths plan and access to resources online, you can start to prepare yourself for trying to help, help your kids. And that's a really important part of it. And that's, there's, there are very, very uh, important things about communication, engagement, relationships. Because really at the heart of it, what 21st century public services are about are establishing a real relationship between two human beings. Some of, the, some of the worst stories in my own family's experience in the health service are about my mother or my brother or other members of my family not being seen as a human being, but, but seeing as a unit. Uh, just, you know, we've done this bit to you. Now, it doesn't really matter to us if you get lost in the hospital. A friend of mine uh, had a mother who was a sleepwalker. And she talk, whenever she went into hospital, she always told the hospital, and she was always found wandering in the hospital in the night. And it's just something, what, something has taken the human connection, the caring connection out. I was discussing this on the ABC this morning, and it was the most powerful message that came back from the, from the people phoning in was that, about how do you restore the human connection, the caring, back into the, into the system. Now, I am um, just going to show this one more slide. This is it's a parable, a parable by Kafka, and I love it because it basically describes everything that goes wrong with public service reform. What we actually often do is we look at a system and we see it's failing, and we bolt on a solution at the end of it. And then when that fails, we bolt on another bolt on. And what this describes is <coughs> something, that, that br something breaking into the system that then just becomes institutionalized as part of the system. It is cheaper to do things well than it is to do them badly. It's true in our own lives. Why shouldn't it be true in public services? The American Medical Association have looked at avoidable accidents in hospital, which is one of the fourth or fifth biggest killers in America. And they've examined accidents in hospitals, and they invariably find that most accidents have a chain of problems, not one cause, and that when you take them apart and then rebuild the system, it is cheaper as well as better as well as safer. Actually, doing things well costs less money. Doing things badly costs money. Um, what's difficult is, is the hump, the, 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 trans, the transition from how we do things badly to how we do things well. It's, it's no different. I mean, it's, in that, it's no different from our own behavior. You know, it actually is deeply satisfying to shout at my son for not tidying up his room. 
It's pointless because it's never worked, and he's 16 now. Um, but I still do it because it's the thing I know how to do. What I don't know how to do is how to motivate him. I do know how to do it. It's actually tidy his room. But it's a kind of, so we, we do know that doing the same thing and failing is in some sense satisfying, but it is also a failure. And we don't want to, I think, we don't want to institutionalize the bolt-on. What we want to do is end-to-end -end service transformation. So look, finally, I just want to make a point about why change fails. Uh, I want to show you a very, a very important uh, educational video about why uh, service transformation fails. Could the lights come down? <coughs> But there must have been a Death Star canteen, yes? There must have been a, a cafeteria downstairs. In between battles where Darth Vader could... Until the blood flowed across the canteen floor. No, the food is hot. You'll need a tray to put the food on. <laughs> oh, I see the food is hot. I'm sorry. I... <laughs> <laughs> oh, <coughs> Yes, I thought you were challenging me to the fight to the death. <laughs> fight to the death? I, this is canteen. I work here. Yes, but I am Vader. I am Lord Vader. Everyone challenges me to fight the death. Lord Vader, Darth Vader. I'm Darth Vader. Lord, Sir Lord Vader. Sir Lord Darth Vader. Lord Darth, Sir Lord, Lord Vader of Cheen. Sir Lord Baron von Vaderham. The Death Star. I run the Death Star. What's the Death Star? This is the Death Star. You're in the Death Star. I run this star. This is the star. This is the fucking star. I run it. I'm your boss. You're Mr. Stevens. <laughs> No, I'm, who is Mr. Stevens? He's head of catering. I'm not head of catering. I am Vader. I can kill catering with a thought. What? I can kill you all. I can kill me with a thought. Just, fuck, I'll get a tray. Okay. Now look, the importance about that is all of us who've been leaders of any organization always assume that everybody in the system knows who they work for. Um, there's loads of people through many organizations who wouldn't be able to say that what, you know, they, which organization they work for. And then even down that far low in the organization, that guy doesn't know who his boss is, but he doesn't know he works for catering because he knows the name of the head of catering, but not the face of the name of catering. And it's that final bit with the boss raging and raging. We've all felt like it, haven't we? I could close you down. Don't you know who I am? I'll have this. It doesn't work. <laughs> Organizations are complex. They require a vision. They need a purpose. They need change all the way through them. Um, and that frustration at the end, you know, I shall have such revenges on you, that wasn't going to achieve the change that Darth Vader wanted. Um, it's not going to achieve the change that we want in public services. What we have to have is a, is a true partnership based on a firm relationship which springs from a conversation. So what I'm going to be doing over the next period when I'm coming back to Adelaide and talking to people is really trying to talk and to listen and to ask the question, not to give an answer, not to transmit, but to receive and to think, what would it be like if we designed and delivered public services at whose heart was the idea that people should treat people like people? So I'm going to go on to do questions, questions and answers. But just before I do that, I just want to ask uh, Sue Jarrett, who's one of the consumer reps on the Older People's Clinical Network, just to give a very brief uh, response. She's a respondent, just to give her reflections on what, what I've been saying. She's been telling me lots and lots of stuff that's far richer in a way than what I've been telling you. She's brilliant. So, <coughs> Sue. 